Amen. We have a, a, a bit of a plan today um, to have two studies this morning and then after lunch a question and answer so that we can um, have more of a discussion about uh, what's presented. So in two presentations it's not possible to cover a great deal but I'd like to review some of what has been um, uploaded just this week, some, some lines and thoughts from, that were presented last Sabbath and then throughout the week. I want to begin uh, by some revision, and most of what is shared is going to be revision, so for some people it might seem new or a lot of information, but I just want to lay out some principles that have already been put into place, some information that, that's already in the record. I want to begin with the history of ancient Israel. So if we were to consider the history of ancient Israel, we know that ancient Israel typifies modern Israel. In the history of ancient Israel, there was the glorious land, Canaan. In the history of modern Israel, there's the glorious land, the United States. Ancient Israel is seen as laid out in two different reform lines. You have the history of Moses, or the Alpha history, where they come out of captivity and were meant to do a work. So in the history of Moses, they come out of Egypt, they go into Canaan, and it was at that point they were uh, meant to uh, really go to the world, fulfill a mission, but they fall into apostasy. They go into captivity and we have the history of, of Medo-Persia, Babylon, etc. And then you have the history of Christ, the Omega. So you have the beginning of ancient Israel and the end of ancient Israel. And this is in a really broad fashion. We can zoom in on those histories and, and const uh, really dig out much more information, relevant information. This is the model of ancient Israel. We come to the history of modern Israel. So in ancient Israel, they come out of captivity, captivity to Egypt. In the history of modern Israel, they come out of captivity. And that's the 1260 years of persecution that takes us to 1798. So 1260 years of persecution, and in 1798 they come out. Here a messenger is raised up, takes them out of captivity. Here William Miller is raised up and takes the people out of captivity. And this is the history of the Millerites. 46 years. The Millerites were meant to finish the work, go to the world, but instead we find they go into apostasy. And we have the history particularly of 1863 in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, they let go of the prophetic message, go into a Laodicean condition, begin to compromise. But we know at the final end of world history, there is an Omega. Millerite history is the Alpha. Moses' history is the Alpha. Then the history of Christ, the Omega. The Alpha history ended in apostasy and failure. The Omega history ends in success. And this is the history of the 144,000, the Omega. So in a very broad fashion, th this is the model of ancient Israel and modern Israel. You have the beginning of Israel, Moses or the Millerites, and then the end, Christ's history or the history of the 144,000. And from these we construct our lines of reformation, when God decides it's time to reform his people. So really the, folk, the history that I want to focus on is this one. It's the history of Christ and what the history of Christ teaches us about the history of the 144,000. This is the end of the ancient glorious land. This is the end of the modern glorious land, which is then we can go into a study of the external events that we are also tracing. <coughs> 
So then to review the history of Christ, we want to review the history of Christ and then from that understand the history of the 144,000. And this began to be laid out at the conference at the end of Germany. We understand this date to be 1798, the end of the 1260, and this date to be 1989, the end of the 126, 1260 time prophecy and then the 126 or the 10th takes us to 1798, this takes us to 1989. And it's from our understanding of this history, the line of the 144,000, that has been more and more developed over the last, particularly the last few years, five years to be exact, from 2014, as we've understood more and more the construction of, a, of the reform line of the 144,000. So I'll make us a little more room. We can leave that part up for the moment. So this is the reform line of Christ, or the en end of ancient Israel. This is the reform line of the 144,000. So for some of you, you may be more familiar with the work that's been done on the line of the 144,000 than our understanding of the line of Christ. So I want to construct them uh, somewhat Simultaneously, the line of the 144,000 begins in 1989, the end of the 126 from 1863, which we, did, which we briefly mentioned before. 1989 to 9-11. 1989, 9-11. And then the next way Mark Ellen White gives us, Sunday Law. Close of probation, Second Advent. But as we're going to focus primarily on this history, I'm going to extend that. Sunday Law. Close of probation, second advent. So we have five primary waymarks on a line of reformation. These five primary way marks divide into that history four dispensations. You can go to the model of agriculture. When Jesus gives, um, gives that parable teaching, he talks about a ploughing. First you plough, then comes the early rain, then comes the latter rain, which prepares the fruit for harvest, and then comes the harvest. And there's different parable models that can be overlaid on top of a line of reformation. So when you consider the work God is doing, first there's a ploughing work or a preparation of the soil, then the early rain, 
So first the preparation of the soil and then the seed is sown. Once the seed is sown, you must receive the early rain. And the plant continues to grow. And then at a point in time, the latter rain comes. The latter rain is to ripen the fruit. So by the end of the early rain, you have fruit visible, but it's not yet ripe. The latter rain ripens that fruit for harvest. We can overlay this with the line of um, any of these reform lines from Moses to the Millerites. We're going to focus on the line of Christ. But the Millerites helps give us another important principle. This is 1798. And this is 1840. 1798, William Miller is already, he's only in his teen years and he's a deist, but he's already identified as raised up of God and the leader of a movement at this point in time. He's going to receive an increase of knowledge. And by 1818, He's understanding those time prophecies that take them to 1844. There's an increase of knowledge. And then in 1833, the formalization. So what we've been able to identify in this history is that there, in this one dispensation, there is a time of the end I don't want to call it the time of the end. I want to call it a message unsealed. There is a message unsealed, an increase of knowledge about that message. That message is formalized. And then we know in the 1840 history, people are tested. And in Millerite history, with William Miller, what they're tested of in 1840 is the day for a year principle. So first of all, a message is unsealed. And Ellen White said in 1798, um, the books of Daniel and Revelation, there was an unsealing, an increase of knowledge, a formalization, and then a test. And this is the same model she presents for the history of Sunday law to close of probation. At Sunday law, there is a message unsealed. There is an increase of knowledge and then a message is formalized and the point at which it is formalized she calls a loud cry. In Millerite history it was known as the midnight cry and they took that from the parable of the ten virgins. A message was unsealed. This was in Millerite history. This is July 21, the Boston camp meeting. There's an increase of knowledge to Concord August 1 and then the midnight cry which was identified as August 15 at the Exeter camp meeting. So that was Boston, Concord and Exeter. In Millerite history on their reform line, this was their increase of knowledge, midnight cry before their shut door of October 22. I, I don't want us to get bogged down in the history, just reminding us of that re repeating pattern. That in every dispensation, every one of these four dispensations, you can identify a message unsealed, ready to be understood by God's people, an increase of knowledge about that message, and then a formalization of that message. Whatever you want to call that formalization. You can see it in 1833 when William Miller begins to preach, or at the Exeter camp meeting, or as Ellen White describes the loud cry message. I'll, I'll remove the, the model of agriculture so our reform line stays a little more simple. One way that we've been discussing, uh, one easier way to understand a reform line is to remember there's these five key waymarks. 1989, 9-11, Sunday Law, close of probation and second advent. The Bible describes 
God's effort to gather his people as an action of his right hand. I'll just see if I can't. Ezekiel 20:34 Ezekiel chapter 20:34 34. And I will bring you out from the people, and I will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered, with a mighty hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. So God's people have been scattered, which you could call a time period of captivity to gather his people, which they first do under Moses, which again is the beginning of ancient Israel, God gathers them with his mighty hand. And you can see from other verses, we won't go to all the, all the texts, that it's described as his right hand. Um, Psalm 89, 13 will show you it as his right hand, which becomes relevant. But it's, it's a description, a gathering of God's people, which is a, is a reformation, is described as the work of God's hand. If you go down to Ezekiel 20, 42, about eight verse, verses further down, Ezekiel 20, 42. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. So when God wants to bring his people out, he does that with his right hand. And a reform line is really just a hand. If you were to see the five key way marks, 1989, 9-11, Sunday law, close of probation and second advent, an easier way to conceptualise that is to imagine the hand of God, that there are five key way marks and four dispensations, ploughing, early rain, latter rain, harvest, however you want to describe them. That also helps us remember the way mark of midnight. When we go to Millerite history, it's at July 21, that Boston camp meeting that is described as midnight or midway. <clears throat> and when we want to think about the, the way mark of midnight or midway, it's the middle, which is always the way mark associated with the Sunday law. So it's the middle of the five way marks. So this is the basic outline of the end of modern Israel. And we can also identify that we have the same repeating pattern in these other two dispensations. So a message is unsealed, increase of knowledge formalization test. But then there is a new message given. There is a new increase of knowledge formalization and test, an increase of knowledge, formalization, test. And then in this history, increase of knowledge, formalization, test. It's, that's the repeating pattern we find throughout our dispensations. So this is the end of modern Israel. We want to consider the end of ancient Israel. We understand that we begin this reform line with the birth, the birth of Christ and John the Baptist. And this first work of ploughing is the work of John, from birth to the baptism of Christ. This first dispensation history is the work of John the Baptist. Just want to identify that at the time of the end, a messenger begins to be raised up. Here it's John. Here it's Elder Jeff. Millerite history, William Miller. First of all, God must raise up a me messenger. Beginning of ancient Israel, Moses, birth of Moses. So you have a messenger raised up who's going to give that message. <clears throat> 
Now I just want to add some information to this line of the end of ancient Israel that we, uh, for most of us, is revision. When we come to a reform line, and we know this, we, we learnt this particularly from the book of Ezra in 2014, but we understand that God calls people out in, in, in three histories, in three separate, by three separate and distinct calls. So first of all, you have the calling of the priests. That first one group is called, First, the priests were called out. And then the Levites. And then finally, the Nethanims. You have three separate groups of people prepared in order. The first group is called from the time of the end and they go through this first ploughing period. This is what we describe as a fractal. It has the same pattern as the larger line but on a smaller scale. And we're going to be a little short of room in that history, but that's okay. First of all, the priests were called, then the Levites, and then the Nethanims. Three separate groups for the service of the sanctuary. When we go to the line of the end of ancient Israel, the history of Christ, do we see the same thing? I just want us to note this third group, when we go to the Nethanims, that third group, it occurs at the Sunday law. It's at the Sunday law that we go to the world and say, come out of Babylon, my people. And it's the swelling of the loud cry before Daniel 12, 1. So we know that at Sunday law, we have a work to go to the world. And this is the harvest. If we took this model, there's ploughing, early rain, latter rain, harvest. If we went to this reform line of the Nethanims, we understand there's ploughing, <coughs> early rain, latter rain, and this history is the history of their harvest. They're cut out from the, for the world and they join God's people. So if we go to the line of the end of ancient Israel, we're going into the history of Christ. And first of all, we find disciples called. The first called begin to come out under the, in the history of John. So first of all, we have the work of John the Baptist and Jesus. And in that history, you have a first group gathered and trained, and that is the disciples. <laughs> A smaller fractal of a reform line. First of all, the disciples are called. And they go through training. God prepares them. They go through their early rain, their, their ploughing, their early rain, their latter rain and their harvest. They go through that experience. And then once the disciples are trained and prepared, who do they go to? Do they go to the world? <coughs> 
No. Where do they go back to? Lost drummers. At Pentecost, where do they go? At Pentecost, they go back to the church. They go back to the church until the stoning of Stephen. So I just, oops, I just want to put in a couple of way marks. The end of ancient Israel, you find three different groups called. First of all, the disciples, they are called, they are trained and prepared. And then when they are trained and prepared, they go back to the church. Once the church has received that message, and once they've stoned Stephen, then we find that the gospel opens up to the world and they go to, Paul is raised up, they go to the Gentiles. So again, you have the three separate calling out. I want to uh, put in a couple of these waymarks. If it's Sunday law, we go to the world. At what waymark do they go to the Gentiles? This is 34 AD and it's the stoning of Stephen. I think I have a quote for that, if I can locate it. In the intro of Paul. Yes. This is Great Controversy 328.1. 328.1. The 70 week or 490 year time prophecy that had been allotted to the Jews ended in AD 34. So there's a time period cut out of a time prophecy that gives the Jews 40, 490 years before they are completely cut off. And that the end point of that 490 years is AD 34. At that time, through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed its rejection of the gospel by the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution of the followers of Christ. Then the message of salvation, no longer restricted to the chosen people, was given to the world. The disciples, forced by persecution to flee from Jerusalem, went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Peter, divinely guided, opened the gospel to the centurion of Caesarea, the God-fearing Cornelius, and the ardent Paul, one to the faith of Christ, was commissioned to carry the glad tidings far hence unto the Gentiles. So it's ju not just Paul, you have the other disciples. The persecution causes them to scatter. Philip, Peter, and then she discusses Paul. They take the, the, the gospel to the Gentiles. That lines up with their harvest period from 34 AD. This is the harvest of the Gentiles or the third group. And when do they go back to the church? It's at Pentecost. At Pentecost, they go back to the church. And that's the second harvest. And prior to that, the disciples had experienced their own. So first of all, God prepares one group of people. They take their perfected message back to the church. Could the disciples do this work efficiently before Pentecost? No, why? Because they have too many problems within their own understanding of Christ's kingdom. First of all, Christ has to work on the first group and correct their misunderstandings. And then they are able to take the message to the church. And then once in two steps, God has dealt with his own people, then it is safe to bring in the Gentiles. God isn't going to bring, he isn't going to bring people into a broken structure. We can be reminded of Christ's 
What did Christ say to the Pharisees? He said to them, you bring all of these people into your church and then you make them twice the, the sons of Satan that you are yourselves. They were not fit to bring in the, the Gentiles into a broken structure. They're misrepresenting God because they do not understand the nature of his kingdom. So he first has to teach people the nature of his kingdom. And then once he has dealt with his church in two steps, then they are ready to take the gospel to the third group. So the disciples, we can fill in this reform line. From the birth of John the Baptist and his ministry to the baptism of Christ. From the birth to the baptism, then we have Jesus go into the wilderness. We have multiple evidences for this being a wilderness time period. In the reform line of Moses, they come out of Egypt here. They cross the Red Sea, they go into the wilderness. So if this is the reform line of the disciples, first of all they're ploughed, then they receive their early rain, and then their latter rain, and then their harvest. So what begins their harvest? What is their great test? This is the cross. I just want to quickly fill in um, this reform line. We go to the line of the Millerites. Again, if we had space, we could lay over all four lines and see this repeating structure of, of a line of reformation. But we see that at this way mark in the, in the history of the Millerites, if this is 1798, this is April 19, 1844, you come to this history and what happens? You have a transfer from one messenger to another. So you have a transfer from William Miller being the voice to Samuel Snow being the voice. July 21st, the midpoint, midway, you have a transfer of, of profit that the people must be listening to from William Miller to Samuel Snow. In the history of Christ, you have a transfer from John the Baptist to the ministry of Christ, from the ministry of Jesus. I want to attach a couple of quotes to that. How you see this transfer from one messenger to another. First spiritual gifts 29.2. First spiritual gifts 29.2. John informed his disciples that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Saviour of the world. As his work was closing, he taught his disciples to look to Jesus, so to look from himself to look to Jesus, and follow Jesus as the great teacher. John's life was without pleasure. It was sorrowful and self-denying. He heralded the first advent of Christ and then was not permitted to witness the miracles and enjoy the power manifested by him. He knew that when Jesus should establish himself as a teacher, he must die. His voice was seldom heard except in the wilderness. So John the Baptist recognises that when Jesus' ministry begins, that people's attention must turn from his teaching to that of Jesus. They must begin to follow the second teacher and he must die prophetically be silenced. So first, William Miller, then Samuel Snow. You see that pattern. First, you could go through the line of Moses. First Moses, then you come to the Jordan and you have Joshua. Moses was not permitted to lead the people into the promised land. John the Baptist was not permitted to see the miracles of Jesus. Before that, 
they transfer their authority to the second. So in this history, the second messenger is Jesus and he begins his work at the midpoint or midway, just as you find in the history of William Miller. For the disciples, ploughing in this first history under John, then the early reign in this history, the latter reign, the ministry of Jesus, and then in towards the end of this latter reign experience, you find the great test, the cross, and the beginning of the harvest. We see that reflected on our own way mark. We've got into history and we identify these two way marks as raffia and panium. That's through tracing the external events uh, as laid out in Daniel 11. So the end of modern Israel, you see this same pattern. The first group ploughed under Elder Jeff from 1989 to 911. And then you see this early rain experience. The rising up of the second messenger, they begin to be heard. If you were to go to the history of the Millerites, this is the history of the letters of Samuel Snow. He's beginning to write, but he hasn't yet um, he hasn't yet reached Boston. No one's listening to him. In this history, Jesus is in the wilderness. He's already be beginning to work the marriage of Cana, all of that, but John is not yet imprisoned. He hasn't yet formally begun his work. And then at this point, you see the transfer. And we identify that, that as 2014, the transfer from the first to the second. We identify Rafi as 2019. That's the history that has been it mostly discussed throughout this year. Then we find the history of the Levites. So the history I want to primarily focus on is this history that leads to Sunday law, not being concerned with that afterwards, because that is the dispensation that we're currently in. If there's four dispensations and we are even on this reform line, this is what God is, what God is giving us an increase of knowledge of. So it's primarily that history I want to focus on. When you go to the history of Christ, you find this first group called, prepared, trained, and then they go through this testing period of the cross. It's the cross that, in its primary application, the cross that tests the first group before they go back to the church, before they go to the Gentiles, that lines up with this year, what we've been anticipating, 2019, before we go back to the church, before we go to the Nethanims or the world. So it's the cross that we've been tracing prophetically throughout this year and the experience of it. When you go to the, this history of John the Baptist, John in this early ploughing time period, what is he teaching? What is the message of John the Baptist? The Saviour has come. How does he describe that? Lamb of God. Only when God makes him say that. Baptism. Only when he's forced to say Lamb of God. What is he thinking? A prophet. In his mind. A prophet. No. no. John the Baptist is thinking and saying, God is raising up a king. He's going to defeat the Romans. kill them all, we're going to rule the world as the head of this massive universal Jewish empire headed by this king that God has raised up. We're all going to be rich, live in his mansions, work in his courts. That's what John the Baptist is teaching. Because that was the understanding of the Jewish nation. Desire of Ages 215.2 215.2, Desire of Ages. Like the Saviour's disciples, 
John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. So what's his, John the Baptist's problem? Even as he's ploughing the people, he himself does not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David. And as time passed and the Saviour made no claim to kingly authority, John became perplexed and troubled. He had declared to the people that in order for the way to be prepared for the Lord, the prophecy of Isaiah must be fulfilled. The mountains and hills must be brought low, the crooked made straight, and the rough places plain. He had looked for the high places of human pride and power to be cast down. He had pointed to the Messiah as the one whose fan was in his hand and who would thoroughly purge his floor, who would gather the wheat into his garner and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Like the prophet Elijah, in whose spirit and power he had come to Israel, he looked for the Lord to reveal himself as a God that answereth by fire. So John the Baptist is raised up at the time of the end to give a message. And he's going to tell the people that, that this saviour has been born, that the time is at hand. He's giving the correct message, but his own concept of what that looks like is incorrect. That's particularly what I want us to understand. He's himself holding on to the understanding that has been the understanding of the Pharisees and the Jewish nation for some time. That when this saviour comes, it's going to be to free them from the Romans. So John the Baptist is raised up. He looks to the Jewish nation and he sees all of their problems. He looks to the glorious land and he sees the glorious land as having all of these problems. But even though he sees those issues, what he's expecting is the annihilation of the Romans. That's his misunderstanding. And then when Jesus comes, John begins to have a problem because he can see that Jesus is not fulfilling his expectations of what this deliverance would look like. Jesus made no claim to kingly authority and John became perplexed and troubled. So John the Baptist's message in this history, Jesus is coming as a king. He's going to defeat the Romans and set up this Jewish empire. And Ellen White speaks of that, particularly throughout the, de the Desire of Ages, focusing on John's mi ministry. So there are still misunderstandings that John holds throughout this time. And those misunderstandings becomes who become whose problem? The disciples. Because it's John that teaches them that Jesus is this king that's going to defeat the Romans. So when you come down to this history... What's the problem? What's the problem here, just prior to the cross? I could see it all crumbling away. It wasn't going to happen. They've been told and told and told that the nature of Christ's kingdom is different to what they expected and is different to what John expected. And yet at that point, many of them hadn't paid attention. They hadn't actually absorbed the lessons they were meant to learn. And so when they actually see that the nature of Christ's kingdom looks different to their expectations, they run away. For all of this history, from the birth to wherever you want it to end it, I don't want to deal with this history now. You can just go to 34 AD in that message. When is the greatest crisis for God's followers? It's this point here. This is the greatest crisis they ever face. And was it before the cross or after the cross? Before. It's before. It's this history just before the cross where they face their greatest test and greatest separation. Of all of this history, it's this one that shakes them. And it's not after the cross, it's before, when the disciples split. Judas leaves the table, many of them run away. The only disciple standing at the foot of the cross as Christ dies is, is um, the beloved disciple, John. 
And who taught them that? Who taught them the lessons that made them run away here? John in this history. Because they have not been willing to unlearn the misconceptions that were held even by John. So when we bring that into our history, we see the end of modern Israel fulfilling the same pattern. And we can, we can, we could spend weeks uh, covering the external and the internal of these waymarks. But we come to the reform line of the priests and we come to this history, the raising up of a messenger, Elder Jeff. Then we face the early rain, then the latter rain and then the harvest. So we find in our own reform line, when should we expect the greatest trouble? Right here. That's the crisis point. And why? Because the nature of Christ's kingdom is different to what has been taught by the Adventist church and what has been, I should say, the Laodicean Adventist church and what has been held on to by who? the first messenger. So many of you are aware that with, within the movement and what we have been um, following these last weeks, that we are coming to, going through a period of crisis. And I want us to see that that crisis is prophetic and expected and has been expected for some time based on where we know we are on our, on our reform lines. And the exact issues have been, that were expected to be an issue, have become an issue. And already it has created a division. But prophetically, we know that this had to have happened. So the end of ancient Israel, the end of modern Israel. Um, we'll close soon in a prayer and then, then we'll come back together. But you can see it in three groups. First, the disciples are prepared and trained to give a harvest message. Um, first prepared and trained, go through their own harvest so they can give a harvest message back to the church between Pentecost and 34 AD. Then one, once the church has been um, thoroughly separated, then those that accept the message of, of the disciples and that, that early church movement, then they can take the gospel to the Gentiles, Philip, Peter, and then the work of Paul. The same thing is being mirrored at the end of modern Israel. God first is preparing a people. We call these priests Levites and Nethanims because of our understanding of Ezra, that those three calling outs. First the priests, they go through their own harvest time period and then they go back to the Levites. They go back to the church before Sunday law. Then once the Adventist church has been thoroughly dealt with, those that have accepted the message for this time can then participate in the work of taking it to the world between the history of the Sunday law and Daniel 12.1 and the loud cry. Within these reform lines that we see demonstrated by these three groups, when we go back to the end of ancient Israel, we can see the message of John, this point, the formalization of his message, John is telling the people to prepare for this mighty king who's going to defeat the Romans. Was Jesus ever intending to defeat the Romans? Is John correct? No. You come to this history, Elder Jeff, there are things within the Time of the End magazine that we are being accused of, of misusing. John had the exact same problem. When John the Baptist is watching the ministry of Jesus and it's not fulfilling what he expected because in this history there's another increase of knowledge. And this increase of knowledge begins to deal with the misunderstandings of this history. This increase of knowledge begins to deal with the misunderstandings of this history. Every increase of knowledge is added light that begins to remove our, our misunderstandings of the nature of Christ's kingdom. But not everyone accepts that here and not everyone accepts that here and it creates a division. And that division occurs before the cross, not afterwards. 
but is a necessary preparation to continue with the work. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. And then when we come back, I want to give us some revision of what has been taught in this history. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you for your Sabbath day that we can study and learn more of you. Lord, there are so many people that have um, misunderstandings of your character. Many of them, Lord, millions deny you as their saviour because they do not understand you and you have been misrepresented to them. I pray, Lord, that we will understand your character, that we can reflect it to the world um, and present a clear message. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.